you. Uh, I think first we have to give due credit to Rob Fury. Uh, you've heard of hedge funds. Uh, Rob is a hedge lecture impresario. <laughs> um, he uses algorithms, uh, and it was only through the, his power of using this uh, mathematical instrument that we were able to get the timing so that David arrives here just five days after he's number one on the New York Times uh, <laughs> list. And it was really a magical algorithm. When you consider the fact that David came on at number one, that means you sold an awful lot of books uh, right away. Uh, and but Rob, you're, as the saying goes, too much. Really are too much. Uh, it's, uh, well, David Brooks is, a, I think, a phenomenon unto him, uh, unto himself. As you know, he's a columnist for the uh, New York Times. And I once said publicly before a public forum like this that he was the only conceptual columnist that the New York Times has. I mean, just think of all the people who have written for the Times and how hard they've worked. Only person who knows how to use concepts. And I was being unfair because it's true, Tom Friedman has had some concepts in the past. <laughs> uh, and um, Paul Krugman has certainly had some concepts. He won the Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, but I don't ever see him using those in his column. <laughs> uh, and most of his columns seem to be talking points that come from some political party. I can't, I, I forget, <laughs> I forget which, one it, which, which one it is. Uh, but. Uh, uh, David and I found ourselves both uh, for coming out of uh, different points of the compass, uh, fascinated with neuroscience and neuroscience research, and the, uh, which has become a huge field. The, the annual meeting of the, uh, what do they call it, the Soci Society of Neuroscience uh, is a, it, it attracts 25, 30,000 uh, uh, academics, and, and you'll see that particularly in, uh, in, in the social animal. And what I have loved about both uh, uh, Bobo books, <laughs> or paradise books, paradisical books, uh, is the, David's ability to use what is the most essential thing for any, I think, any writer, and certainly the most essential thing for fiction writers, uh, which is the telling detail um, that makes you live the circumstances that he's uh, writing about. And he's done it uh, three times now, and I'm, and I'm always in awe of the talent with which he, <clears throat> uh, with which he does it. Um, I'd like to just read a little bit of Bobo's in Paradise. Uh, and the beginning of it, which is called The, Ride of the, the Rise of the Educated Class, uh, I think uh, is a masterpiece. That doesn't mean you have to click, clap more loudly when you've heard this uh, than any, anything else. But, uh, <clears throat> chapter one is called The Rise of the Educated Class. <clears throat> And it begins, <clears throat> I'm not sure I'd like to be one of the people featured in the New York Times wedding pages, but I know I'd like to be the father of one of them. <laughs> uh, imagine how happy Stanley J. Cogan must have been, for example, when his daughter Jamie was admitted to Yale. Then imagine his pride when Jamie made Phi Beta Kappa and graduated summa cum laude. Uh, Stanley himself is no slouch in the brains department. He's a pediatric urologist uh, in Croton on Hudson with teaching positions in the Cornell Medical Center and the New York Medical College. Still, he must have enjoyed a gloat or two when his daughter put on that cap and gown. And things only got better. Jamie breezed through Stanford Law School. And then she met a man, Thomas Arena, and these are all real names, uh, who appeared to be exactly the sort uh, of son-in-law that pediatric urologists dream about. Uh, he did his undergraduate work at Princeton, 
where he too made Phi Beta Kappa and graduated summa cum laude. And he too went to law school at Yale. After school, they both went to work as assistant U.S. attorneys for the mighty Southern District uh, of New York. <clears throat> These two awesome resumes collided at a wedding ceremony in Manhattan. <laughs> and given the school chums who must have attended, the combined tuition bills in that room must have been <laughs> staggering. <laughs> the rest of us got to read about it in the New York Times wedding page. The page readers, uh, the, the page is a weekly obsession for hundreds of thousands of Times readers and aspiring Balzacs. Uh, unabashedly elitist, secretive, and totally honest, the mergers and acquisitions page, as some devotees call it, um, <laughs> has always provided an accurate look at at least a chunk of the American ruling class. Over the years, it has reflected the changing ingredients of elite status. And when, and I think this, not to parse your own book, but this is the important uh, paragraph in, in this first chapter. When America had a pedigreed elite, the page, New York Times wedding page, emphasized noble birth and breeding. But in America today, it's genius and geniality that enable you to join the elect. And when you look at the Times wedding page, you can almost feel the force of the mingling SAT scores. <laughs> uh, it's Dartmouth marries Berkeley. MBA weds PhD. Fulbright hitches with Rhodes. Um, Lazar Frere joins with CBS. And summa cum laude embraces summa cum laude, and you rarely see a summa selling for a magna. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the tension in such marriages would be too great. Uh, the Times emphasizes four things about a person. College degrees, graduate degrees, career path, and parents' profession. For these are the markers of upscale Americans uh, today. And uh, that is a tremendous insight into what is in the changes in this country over the, over the past, uh, uh, oh gosh, it starts about 1970 for, uh, for real. And that is the, 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 the kind of great insight out of which I think great books of, of sociology uh, are written. And in this case, you get sociology with a literary flair, uh, with a f fabulous attention uh, to detail that's just going to make any, any, any other author kind of melt with, uh, with envy. And so that I can envy him either more, I want David Brooks to come to the, uh, to the rock. Needless to say, coming here, I, I imagine that this was the most elaborate April Fool's joke that had ever been played on me. <laughs> the fact that Tom Wolfe would be reading from my book uh, only seems weirder by the fact that Generals Lee and Washington are looking over the shoulders. <laughs> but so far, it seems real. I, I assume I'd come here and there'd be nobody here. They'd just laugh at me. Uh, and so this is a moment of surprise uh, and um, I don't know how to express it. Tom is my hero. I've spent my whole life trying to A, write like him, and B, know that I can't read him before I write. <laughs> because if you read that prose and then try to write, you come across as third-rate Tom Wolfe. So you have to have a few hours in between. Uh, it is a great honor for me to be on stage here with Tom, uh, and a great surprise. Uh, my life has been full of surprises. I'm going to talk about a few of them uh, on the way to my theme tonight. Uh, and one of the surprises is political. I started out my life somewhat on the left. Uh, my parents were professors at NYU in the 1960s. We lived near Greenwich Village. Uh, and they were somewhat on the left. The family lore is my grandmother, who owned an art gallery in the village, served hash brownies to my parents on their wedding reception, which is <laughs> somewhat left wing. My uh, parents in 1965 took me to a be-in where hippies would go just to be. Uh, 
Uh, and one of the things they did as part of their being is they uh, set a garbage can on fire and threw their wallets into it to demonstrate their liberation from money and material things. And I was a five-year-old and I saw a five-dollar bill in the garbage can and I ran into the fire and reached into the fire and grabbed the money and ran away. And that was more or less my first step over to the right. Uh, and, uh, Another aspect of my childhood, my parents, uh, my great-grandfather was a kosher chicken butcher on the Lower East Side, but basically my family story was essentially a hundred years of secularization. And so by the time I came along, my parents took me, brought me to a school called Grace Church School in Lower Manhattan, where I was part of the all-Jewish boys davening choir. Uh, we were about 25% of the choir was Jewish. Uh, and so we would sing the hymns, but to square it with our religion or what was left of it, when the word Jesus would come up in a hymn, we just would omit that word. And so the, the volume would drop down and then it would come back down. But again, to prove that life is full of surprises, I married a woman who was Protestant, but a couple of years later, uh, she announced she wanted to convert to Judaism, and then she announced she wanted to study to become a rabbi, then she announced she wanted to keep a kosher home, which we do, she wanted to send our kids to Jewish day school, which we do, and my line is, this is how we know God exists, because only he would go so far out of his way to screw me this badly. <laughs> So, uh, and I also, of course, as a young kid, wanted to be a writer. I knew I wanted to be a writer in second grade. Uh, and I used to write Paddington the Bear stories, if some of the students know Paddington the Bear. Uh, he's probably gone, long gone from children's literature by now. Uh, and I remember in high school, I wanted to date a woman named Bernice. And she, unfortunately, wanted to date somebody else. Uh, and I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. Uh, and, but I, I didn't actually become the kind of writer I thought I wanted to be. I thought I wanted to be Clifford Odets, who was a left-wing playwright in the 1930s. Uh, and by the time I got to college, I realized it was no longer the 1930s, uh, which was a surprise to me. Uh, and I, I stumbled into reportage. And I stumbled into that in part because I just liked being around people and watching people. And I spend a lot of my life now watching politicians, uh, and I can tell you they are all emotional freaks of one sort or another. Uh, they have what I call Lageria Dementia, which is they, means they talk so much they drive themselves insane. Uh, and what, but what they have, and what's sort of fascinating about being a reporter is you get to see them up close, you get to see their incredible social skills. And so when you meet politicians, they touch your lapels, they'll rub the back of your head, they'll caress your cheek, uh, they will invade your personal space. I once uh, saw uh, Ted Kennedy and Dan Quayle meet at the well of the Senate. I was up in the Senate press gallery, and they gave each other these big hugs, and they stayed hugging, and their faces were like this far apart, and their hands were moving up and down each other's backs, and they were sort of grinding away down there, and I was, I was like, get a room, I don't want to see this. Um, and then I was, camp I was following Mitt Romney around in the last election cycle in New Hampshire, uh, and he was um, a c big campaigning up there with his five perfect sons, Bip, Chip, Rip, Sip, Dip, and Lip, and Skip. Uh, and, and he went into a diner in New Hampshire, uh, and he introduced himself to each family at the diner and asked them what village in New Hampshire they were from, and then he would describe the home he owned in their village. Uh, and he was... Uh, and so he, he goes around uh, the whole diner, and on his way out, he's met like 30 or 40 people. He first names almost everybody he's just met. And that's the sort of thing you don't see if you're not a reporter. Uh, and so you become fascinated by that. And then for the book Bobos that Tom mentioned, I just became fascinated by shopping. So I hung around stores. Uh, I hung around Home Depots to watch American men buy a barbecue grill, uh, because that's when I think they're most emotionally exposed. <laughs> sort of do the manly waddle that men do in the presence of large amounts of lumber. Uh, they're going to pick out the biggest grill, the 942-inch grill surface, in case they get the urge to roast a bison. Uh, they're going to 
take it out to their, uh, or they're going to buy a Weber Genesis grill, because in America it makes sense to name a barbecue grill after a book in the Bible. Uh, <laughs> and then they'll take it out to their Yukon XL in the big box mall, and you'll see a PetSmart over here and a Petco over there, and then uh, along the highway all the suburban theme restaurants, which if they merged would be called Chili's Olive Garden Hard Rock Outback Cantina, stuck there. <laughs> And then I, I always mention my favorite store, there's Walmart over here, and then my favorite store, which is the Costco, which is Walmart on acid, uh, <laughs> which is for people who buy, uh, you know, bags of 60 pounds of tater tots, uh, packages with like 3,000 Q-tips, which is 6,000 swabs, because there's one at either end. I, I was going to Costco thinking, you know, who comes here shopping for condoms? Because the quantities <laughs> are so large. And, and that's ultimately why you become a writer, to, to see all the optimistic people in America. Um, um, and so while I, I thought I wanted to become Clifford Odets, uh, I actually ended up, much to my surprise, becoming a, a different sort of writer. Uh, really what I am is I'm a, I'm a cut-rate Digby Baltzell. Uh, Digby Baltzell was a great sociologist in the 1950s. There really was a golden age of sociology. Uh, in 1955 to 1965, really a golden age of nonfiction. And I would list Digby Boltzell, Jane Jacobs, David Reisman, Daniel Bell, publishing important books which were sort of low academia, high journalism, Suffer t tackling big subjects. Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, who was a theologian writing then, wrote a book called The Nature and Destiny of Man a title I've always admired because after you've written a book with that title, what do you do next? It sort of, <laughs> sort of covered the territory. Uh, but, and, but I found when I became a columnist in particular that basically the sort of writing I thought I wanted to do, I either couldn't pull it off or, or it wasn't right. And so really I took that style, that great nonfiction style of those writers who were really thriving between 55 and 65, and I sort of popularized it and put it in 800 words. And so I've become a much different sort of writer than I imagined and really wanted to be. Uh, uh, and that's because life is full of surprises. And so that gets us into really what my theme tonight is. Uh, it's about being pulled by currents into lives that we don't expect and being pulled by currents in ways into behavior we don't expect. And that we live in a world that's both visible and invisible that's covered in part by newspapers, the how, the how, why, what, when, but also by poetry, which goes beneath those questions. It's a world that's both physical, the world of the body, but also the world of the spirit. It's a, it's a world of the surface and the undercurrents. And so one of the things a writer tries to do, and I guess all of us try to do, is try to see th these two different realms at once, the world of the visible and the world of the invisible. And the struggle for a writer is to try to capture the things that are obvious, but then the things that are hard to see but influence us in ways we don't understand. And then how do you communicate that to people who are, who are just reading for fun? And I think what Tom managed to do with new, new journalism and in the novels is to capture both those realms, to capture the surface realm, but then also take us to that ethereal thing the things of the zeitgeist, what we call the zeitgeist, the things of the culture, the things of the spirit, and the things that make a man in full or a woman in full. And so my theme tonight is, how do we understand a man and woman in full? And I think all of us who are maybe in life, but certainly in the business of writing, are in that job, trying to get the fullness and trying to understand the fullness. Now in the last couple of years, I've had some help in trying to understand this fullness, the visible and the invisible, from an unexpected source, a source I didn't really ex thought that would help me. I usually think of if I'm going to understand the depth of who we are, I'm going to go to theology or I'm going to go to philosophy. But in fact, it's been realms uh, like neuroscience, realms like the cognitive sciences, realms like psychology and sociology that I think have given us new insights or really reminded us of old insights of who we are, who, what is a man and woman in full. And the revolution in understanding ourselves that they've given us over the last 30 years does not lead where I thought it would lead to a cold mechanistic view of who we are. It leads, I think, to a much richer and humanistic view of who we are. Because it has three key insights. If you take all the work that's been done over these years, I think it revolves around three foundational ideas. 
The first insight is that while the conscious mind writes the autobiography of our species, most of our thinking is unconscious. The human mind can take in 12 million pieces of information a minute, of which it can be consciously aware of about 40. And this unconscious action leads to peculiarities. People named Dennis are disproportionately likely to become dentists. Uh, people named Lawrence are disproportionately likely to become lawyers because unconsciously we gravitate toward things that are familiar, which is why my own daughter is named President of the United States Brooks. <laughs> When you go out to eat, if you go out to eat alone, you'll eat about this much. If you go out with one other person, you'll eat on average 35% more. If you go out with three other people, you eat on average 78% more. You're not thinking about that, but these are unconscious things that are happening. And the unconscious is not only where the action is, it's where much of the smartest action is. So if you have trouble making up your mind, one of the things you can do is flip a coin and tell yourself, okay, I'll settle, up, I'll settle this decision with a coin flip. But then don't go with how the coin comes up, heads or tails. Go with your emotional reaction to how the coin came up. And that's your inner mind telling you what you wanted all along. And so a lot of the action is unconscious. A lot of the smartest action is unconscious. The second insight is that we're not divided creatures. We're not separated between reason over here and emotion over here. But emotion is, in fact, the foundation of reason. There's a scientist named Antonio Damasio, who's also a great writer, who studies people who've suffered brain lesions and can't process emotion. And these people are not super smart Mr. Spocks, they're super dumb. Because what emotion does, it provides value. It assigns value to things, tells you what you want, what you don't want, what you admire, what you have contempt for. And without a valuation mechanism, you can't make sensible decisions. So emotions really are, the, in many ways, the smartest part of our minds. Now, I'm a middle-aged American man. I'm not particularly comfortable talking about emotion. My wife jokes that me writing a book about emotion is like Gandhi writing a book about gluttony. Uh, it's not <laughs> the normal thing that I do. Uh, and there's a great brain research story, which is apocryphal, but I like it in any way, where they took a bunch of middle-aged guys, hooked them in an fMRI brain scan machine, had them watch a horror movie, and then had them ask them to describe their feelings toward their wives. And the brain scans were the same in both activities. Just uh, sheer terror. Uh, and so I sort of get that. Uh, nonetheless, emotion tells us what we want. Emotion also tells us what to remember. Emotion literally builds the fibers of the mind. In the 1940s, there was an orphanage uh, out west where they decided the way to keep babies safe was to uh, keep them antiseptic, germ-free. Uh, and so uh, what they did was they fed them, they gave them medical care, they did not touch them, they did not handle them. And the mortality rate for those babies by age two was 37%. In fact, they stopped naming the babies because they were dying at such high frequencies. And so emotion literally uh, wires the, the mind. The third great insight of this field, uh, after the power of the unconscious and the importance of reason as, a found uh, as emotion as a foundation for reason, is the interpenetration of minds. When we look at each other, we have areas in our mind that don't only observe, they reenact what they see. And so when, you, when I pick up a glass, your brain is, looks as if you yourself are picking up the glass. And if I pick it up to drink, it looks like, it looks one way, but if I pick it up to put it in the dishwasher, it looks another way. So when you see me, you're reenacting the action in your own head, and you're also judging the intention behind the action. And perception is this deep flow of loops, one to another. And many of these loops are things that we barely even think about. Uh, for example, people who suffer the loss of smell suffer an incredible emotional deterioration because a lot of what we get from each other comes through smell in ways we're not even aware of. One, science, one experiment that illustrated this was uh, done in Germany, where they took a bunch of uh, people, stuck gauze pads under their arms, had some people watch a horror movie, other people watch a comedy. Then they took other research subjects who were primarily, presumably extremely well paid, and they asked them to sniff the gauze pads. <laughs> and then they said, what movie did this wearer watch? And people could tell at way above average chance what that person watched. Uh, and women were a lot better than men. But we get all these signals through smell. And so when you look at this work, what you see is that while we're inheritors of the French Enlightenment, Rene Descartes and such, who thought that reason was the most important faculty, 
the really the people who got it right were the leaders of what you call the Scottish Enlightenment, David Hume, Adam Smith, Edmund Burke, who said what they called the sentiments are the wisest part. Reason is weak, but the sentiments are what we would call the emotions are strong. And so you need both these systems, but if you want to understand the fullness of it, I think you have to understand what a lot of our culture does not emphasize, the things that are deepest and down inside in that realm of the sentiments. And so when we think about things like human capital and when we think about what it takes to succeed in the world, often we're thinking about the things we can count and measure on the surface of life, IQ, grades, SAT scores, jobs, all the things that get measured on the New York Times wedding page. But in reality, there are things deeper down that are much more important. And ironically, it's the scientists with all their fancy technology who are re-illuminating a lot of that. And so the qualities that it takes to succeed are often things like mindsight, which is the ability to go into another person's mind and learn what's there. Now babies come equipped with this facility. There's a scientist named Alan Meltzoff who leaned over a baby in 1979 and this baby was 43 minutes old. He wagged his tongue at the baby and she wagged her tongue back at 43 minutes. And that's because babies are wired to connect and to mimic and that's how they learn. Uh, babies are phenomenally good, by the way, uh, at looking at uh, monkey faces and distinguishing one monkey from another because they're really good at studying faces. This is a facility we lose in uh, adulthood. So some people have this ability to, to make relationships and to sort of download information from the other. Another skill I think the science emphasizes a skill might, you might call equipoise, which is the ability to look inside your own mind and detect the weaknesses there. And so, for example, human beings, all of us, unconsciously are overconfidence machines. 96% of college professors in this country believe they have above average teaching skills. <laughs> time, time, time Magazine asked Americans, are you in the top 1% of earners? 19% of Americans are in the top 1%. Of <laughs> this, by the way, is a strongly gender-linked trait. Uh, men drown at twice the rate as women because men have tremendous confidence in their ability to swim, especially after they've been drinking. <laughs> But some people have the ability to detect the flaws and the biases in their own minds and to counteract them, to, be, uh, to sort of compensate for ambiguous evidence with ambiguous conclusions, to be curious, to be open-minded, to build modesty bootstraps for themselves. Peter Drucker had one where he said, write down every decision you make and then uh, seal it in an envelope for nine months, open it up in nine months, and you'll find that a third of your decisions were right, a third were wrong, a third were in the middle, but in almost all cases, your reasoning will have been irrelevant. And when you do that, that's a reminder of how little you know, how little you know about yourself, how little you can know about the world. And that is a great trait that does not correlate with IQ or any of the things we can measure, but is half emotional and half rational. The third trait you might mention is a Greek word called metis, the ability to look over a landscape and see the things that matter, see the patterns and to distinguish what matters from what doesn't matter. My newspaper did a great uh, story about soldiers in Iraq and Baghdad, some of whom could look down a street and tell whether there was an IED, a bomb, and a landmine planted in the street. And when you ask them, how do you know, they couldn't tell you. They said, I just feel a coldness inside. And so that ability to perceive reality comes from long experience because people who have experience and who have studied the world carefully see the world in a different way. In one experiment, they took chess grandmasters and chess novices and gave them five minutes to st study, or five seconds, to study a chessboard. And they said, memorize as many pe pieces as you can. The chess grandmasters could easily memorize every piece on the board. The novices only about four or five pieces. And that's because the Grand Masters did not see individual pieces, they saw formations of pieces. The difference between seeing letters and a paragraph. And then they moved the, board, the pieces so they were in a position that could never actually occur in a chess game. And in this case, the chess Grand Masters were no better than anybody else. Because again, their ability to see that things they built up over the years, they could not use. And then the fourth and final trade I'll measure, I'll mention, which is half conscious, half unconscious, is sympathy. And that's the ability to look into other people's minds and to be nuanced to how they're feeling at a given moment. And this comes in extremely handy working in groups. 
Most of us work in groups because groups are smarter than individuals. And face-to-face -face groups are much smarter than groups that meet any other way. And so scientists at the University of Michigan uh, gave two set sorts of groups tests. They gave one group 10 minutes to solve a series of math tests. And they uh, had them meet face-to-face. -face. And those face-to-face -face groups could easily solve the math tests. Then they gave other groups 30 minutes to solve the math tests. But those groups had to communicate by email or electronically. Those groups all failed. And because so much of our communication is by gesture, by intonation, the email groups, the people who try to live their lives by email or by Facebook or by texting, find that it's a very poor substitute for the face-to-face -face communication because so much is going on unconsciously. And so all of these th things which the neuroscience and the cognitive science point to are traits that are hard to count, hard to measure, but which are actually deep down inside us. And some of these things come to us through genetics, some to it co come to us from experience, and some of it comes from the subject that I write about and Tom writes about brilliantly, which is culture and the, the moment, what the era of the moment is. Now, culture is also something that comes to us in ways we're almost vaguely aware of. But culture is incredibly powerful in predicting how we see the world and how we react to the world, again, in ways we don't think about too much. Some scientists had the good idea to look at people from different cultures as they looked at the painting of the Mona Lisa. And when they looked at people from Asia, they measured their eye movements. And their eyes darted all over the painting. Then they looked at the Americans, and the Americans just focused on the eyes and the mouth of the Mona Lisa, a much tighter gaze. When you ask students from China to describe a fish tank, they'll describe all the different fish, the vegetation, the, the stones in the bottom, the nature of the glass. They'll describe the whole context. When you ama ask American students to describe a fish tank, they just pick the biggest fish and describe that. <laughs> Another uh, experiment which showed the importance of culture was a very clever experiment where they observed people having coffee in cities around the world and measured how often people having coffee with one another reached across the table and touched each other's hands affectionately. In Rio, they touched each other's hands on average about 180 times an hour. In Paris, about 120 times an hour. In London, zero times an hour. <laughs> Uh, another scientist asked Afghans and Americans to describe the word corruption. The Americans said, well, giving a job to your cousin, nepotism, that, that would be corruption. Then when they asked the Afghans, he said, well, if you have some jobs to give out and you don't give it to your cousin, that's corruption. <laughs> because in Afghan society, without rule of law, you depend on social networks. So, of course, you're going to give it to your cousin because you need that. That's how your society is structured totally opposite meanings of the word corruption. And so this is the power of culture that flows through us, often in ways we don't think about until someone reminds us. And I'll conclude a bit by talking about American culture now and where I think it is. I think parts of American culture, as this room reminds us, are deep and permanent. Europeans came to this continent hundreds of years ago, and they saw forests that stretched out into infinity. They saw flocks of geese so big it took them 45 minutes to take off. In fact, they would fire cannonballs into the geese just to see if they could shift the migration patterns. And they had two thoughts when they saw all this abundance. The first was that God's plans for humanity would be completed here on this continent. And the second was that they could get really rich in the process. <laughs> And so we have a moral, uh, moral materialism starting from the 17th century right up till today, which is permanent even for those of us who had no ancestors around. Alexis de Tocqueville described in America in the 1830s, which is still with us today, a culture that transcends the individuals and the ethnicity of the people who come here, that makes us incredibly energetic, that makes us accept outsiders, that makes us divorce more, but move more, switch jobs more, and kill each other more. And so this is the permanent nature of our culture, which means you should never be pessimistic about America because there are certain fundamental things that are, I think are eternal to our culture and to our country, which we can always fall back on. And yet within that permanence, of course, there is cultural change. And I, I thought I'd 
talk about one theme of cultural change, which I think Tom has written about more and more brilliantly over the decades than anybody else. And I will describe it in a slightly different way than he did, but really I'm rehashing ground that he has been covering for decades. And that's something you might call the expansion of the self. A few months ago, I was driving in my home in Bethesda, Maryland, and I had NPR on. And uh, I was listening to a show called, uh, I forget what it's called, but on Sunday nights on NPR, they rebroadcast old radio shows. And one of the shows I happened to hear one Sunday night was called Command Performance. And this was a variety show that went out to the troops in World War II. And the particular show I happened to hear was broadcast on VJ Day, 1945, the day the U.S. learned they won the war. In fact, it was broadcast live just hours after the announcement came. And Bing Crosby, who was the host of the show, gets out there at first and he says, we've just learned we've won the war, but we don't feel proud, we feel humble, we're just glad we got through it. And this note of humility was repeated again and again throughout the show. Burgess Meredith, the actor, came out in the middle and read a passage from Ernie Pyle, the war correspondent, and Pyle had written, we won this war because we have great allies, we have brave soldiers, we didn't win it because we're God's chosen people, we didn't win it because we're special, we should just be humble and try to be worthy of the peace. And it was just striking this tone of modesty and humility. Then I get home, I turn on the TV, I'm watching a football game, and a guy throws, a quarterback throws a pass, a wide receiver catches it, and is tackled after a two-yard gain. And the, the safety or cornerback, whoever, does what all professional athletes do after a tremendous achievement. He gets up and does a victory dance in celebration of himself. And it occurred to me I'd seen a more self-puffing victory dance after a two-yard gain than I just heard after the US won World War II. <laughs> And it occurred to me this was a, a change from a culture of self-effacement to a culture of self-expression. Self-effacement being, I'm no better than anybody else, but nobody is better than me. And so I think there has been this cultural shift, what some people called the me decades, and in other ways called the expression of, of narcissism. And this is not only a shift that I imagine for, uh, or nostalgia for an era when I wasn't alive, there actually is some statistical evidence to suggest there has been this sort of cultural shift. One of my favorite polling statistics, Gallup organization in 1950 asked high school seniors, are you a very important person? And in 1950, 12% said yes. They asked the same question again in 2005, and this time it wasn't 12%, it was 80%. <laughs> and so that's a shift in our understanding of who we are. This shift is understandable. You can see it in many other ways. In the past few decades, our math scores and global comparisons have gone down. But when it comes to who, which people in which country in the world think they're the best at math, we are number one. <laughs> if you look at things like questions where they ask people, are you easy to like? There's the, been this radical shift in students thinking, yes, I am easy to like. There's been a shift in overconfidence. Over the years, the amount of hours per year college students spend studying has declined steadily. College GPAs have gone up steadily. And there are some theories, some people say we've created a generation of praise addicts. A study I saw recently uh, asked college students, would you rather receive a compliment or have sex? And more people would rather receive a compliment. Uh, I can tell you that's the wrong answer. <laughs> This expansion of sex uh, has also created actual things we can see and measure. This uh, expansion of the self. <laughs> so, uh, that were the notes from my Los Angeles lecture. <laughs> uh, expansion of the self. Uh, it's created changes in... Uh, oh boy. Where? <laughs> I've read a whole book on the unconscious and Freud finally gets his revenge. <laughs> uh, it's changed the way we spend. So we begin to spend on ourselves as we think befits our station. If you look at spending patterns across the 20th century, they're relatively flat until about 1970. So personal debt as a percent of GDP is about 45% of GDP for decade after decade until 1970, and then it shoots up to 143%. 
per total consumption, including household and financial debt, is about 150% of GDP. 1970 shoots up to 350. And that is a real change. Public debt. Every generation has an incentive to push its spending debt onto future generations. No generation has done it to the extent that we have until right now. And I think that's in part because we have less of a connection because we have a special view of ourselves with the train of generations before and after us. Third, polarization. Why, are people not, why do people not divide into polar opposites? Why are people willing to have a conversation? It's because they have an essential modesty they, where they believe that if my side got its way, things would be terrible because I am imperfect in how I understand the world. And if you are aware of your own imperfection in the way you see the world, if you are modest about your own knowledge, then of course you need the conversation. You need your political opponents to balance off your own beliefs. But if you think you have 100% grasp on the truth, then the people in the other party are just sort of in the way. And so I think the expansion of the self has contributed to the polarization we see around us. It's no accident that Rush Limbaugh is both kind of a polar partisan figure, but also his, his humor is based on the magnification of his own ego. And so along with the strength of American culture, there is a shift in American culture, this expansion of the self, which has led to flowery stuff for Tom and to a lesser degree I to make fun of in these years. But I think it's created some problems in our culture that we will have to compensate for in the years ahead. And these are shifts, the shift in the expansion of the self, like the permanent good things in American culture, are things we're vaguely aware of. And so my theme tonight has been the marrying of these two things, the surface of life, the shopping, the politics, and trying to connect that and articulate some concrete way and some way we can appreciate and understand the power of the undercurrents of life, the power of the invisible. And really the job of a writer uh, is to try to speak both languages, the life of the surface and the life of the undercurrents. And that's what uh, Tom has done and that's what I tried to do, though I, don't, I really do not compare myself in the same league. Uh, and so finally, the final thing to be said is to remind us of the healing power of the country. Uh, and so as we look ahead, when we think about the future of the country and the future of the Bobo class, uh, the future of all the classes, if you want to feel good about the country, look at the kids of the Bobo class. There is a lot of concern about Facebook and texting and what it's doing to American culture. I happen to be a tremendous believer that the youngest, this generation, people under 30, are going to have a tremendously positive influence on American culture. And I base that confidence, A, on the fact that people like me are such phenomenally good parents. <laughs> That's not exactly it. I base it on the, the social science data that one can observe. That if you take a look at all the social indicators that went south in the 60s and stayed bad through the 80s, now all those social indicators for the past 10 years have been moving in the right direction. So crime is down 70%. Teenage pregnancy is down a third. Abortion rates are down a third. Domestic violence is down 50%. Teenage suicide is down. Teenage drug use is down. Divorce rates for people under 30 are lower than divorce rates for people over 30 after the same number of years of marriage. This is an incredibly wholesome and responsible generation. They're all going to have the biggest midlife crisis in human history in about 10 years. <laughs> but until then, uh, they will be the salvation of the country. And so what I've tried to describe here is these currents, the currents that we don't see, that are hard to express in uh, newspaper articles, but really which are guiding our lives and which, uh, thanks to the younger generation, uh, will preserve the country uh, despite us. Thank you very much.